This is my presentation. I've put a picture of what's not a small drainage structure on the fronters piece, just to show you that that's not what we're talking about. That happens to be Canyon Diablo uh, near a place called Two Guns in Arizona. And uh, Doug, my mate up there, we went over to America three times before we finally got out to see it. But uh, it's a bit hard to get to. So, um, yeah, what I'm talking about today is an often neglected modelling detail, prototype design, materials and construction, including sourcing standards, modelling using commercially available products, and scratch building, including sourcing materials. And with the scratch building, I'm not going to give a demonstration. What I've done is just basically given you a recipe which everyone can read later at their own leisure. Um, and some ideas of where you can get your materials. I'll, I'll be going through materials where you can buy them because a lot of people, like everything in the hobby, one of the hardest things is say, I'd like to build such and such, and you can't necessarily build it because you don't know where to get the, the parts from, and often you don't know where to get the designs from. And it's amazing now with Google and the internet how much information is available to us on a computer. Just about every state road authority will have its standards for drainage structures and anything else you're interested in. So looking up and using them. All the highways departments have them easily available um, on, online. And of course, um, then if you're a member of historical societies and you want older things, like I'm, I'm a member of the Santa Fe Rail Historical and Modelers Association, they have a lot of books and publications that you can access. So that's just a little bit of a beginning. Uh, my background is I was a civil engineer for almost 50 years and uh, I just thought I'd do the right thing and put a few qualifications up there to impress you all. Slightly, <laughs> this... slightly overqualified for the years. The... Sorry? You're slightly overqualified for the topic, I think. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I've, 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 I've done everything from designing them to being down in the, in the mud when pouring rain, clean them out when it's, uh, when it's raining, you know. So without further ado, we'll see if this works. It doesn't. Excuse me, where's my tech support? He's... Oh. Tech support here? Tech support? Where's my tech support? How does this thing work? Because it's not moving to the next slide, please. No. So it should just do that, I would have thought. Probably the battery's flat. I blame the battery. Ah, there we go. Just got to it. I didn't have the touch. Yeah. That's not unusual. Anyway, um, one of my personal observations of years of inspecting model railroad layouts all over the world is that um, modelling of major bridge structures over gorgeous rivers, creeks is generally given precedence and is generally well done. The exception may be bridge bearings and anchorages, but that's material for another clinic. So more drainage structures like culverts are often overlooked. I just wanted to go through some just some basic railway engineering, it's pretty basic stuff. Basic design criteria when it comes to prototype railway design are to join the point of departure with the destination by the shortest route practicable, to minimise gradients, i.e. the ratio of the rise in altitude to the distance travel, vertical rise divided by horizontal run, we all know that, but it's surprising on forums how many people say, oh, what's grade? They don't, don't know. You got it? You do that for me? Thank you. Um, and for example, a 1 in 40 is, is a 2.5% 2 2 grade. And to maximise the radius of curves. Now, well, so, oh, gee, I'm, I haven't got the Pointed touch. Pointed at the, the computer. Oh, the computer. That's where I'm going wrong. Right. Oops, that's going forward again. Sorry about this. Righto. Dot points two and three are to minimise the drag from the load on the locomotives hauling the train. In an ideal world, a railway would be designed and constructed in a straight line on flat terrain with no curves. Curve radii on model railways are constrained by layout location size. You know, our baseboards basically. And larger, as we know, is always better for operation and aesthetics. Unfortunately, the topography in the real world is not flat, but consists of mountains, hills, valleys, gorges and rivers which must be traversed. Mountains and hills must be accommodated by tunnelling, cutting or traversing side slopes, filling or bridging the valleys, depressions and bridging watercourses. 
to avoid prohibitive grades which have the greatest impact on the efficiency of locomotives, a railway will sacrifice minimising the distance between the points, two points and travel further to avoid expensive tunnelling, bridging and large earthworks. Try again. That is why route selection involves integrating railway infrastructure into the landscape to reduce the need for expensive engineering structures, excavations and earthworks at the expense of travelling further to reach the destination. The object of the exercise is to reduce grades on railways carrying tr freight traffic to a maximum of about 1.5%, 1 in 67. Grades of 2% or more are considered high and in the days of steam, even 1%, 1 in 100, would have helpers in America, bank engines we call, if you model British. Now we just add locomotives. Examples of steep mainline grades are the steepest mainline grade in the USA is at Saluda in North Carolina. It's 4.7%. Now, a lot of us kid ourselves on our models, we probably have 5%, you know, and we wonder why we can't only take about two or three cars up. Um, the operator, Norfolk Southern, has closed this line down because of, of that. The Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe at Raton Pass, New Mexico, at 3.3% but it's no longer traversed by freight trains, only Amtrak, and if you've followed the news overseas, mm. they're actually talking about rerouting um, Amtrak off that route because of the cost of maintenance of that line to, the, to what's now the BNSF. Uh, Cajon Pass, which was an area I'm interested in, is 3% uh, used for westbound downhill traffic, while eastbound uphill grade is 2.2%. The maximum grades on Australian prototype railways are similar in New South Wales and um, in particular and less, they're probably less in, in Victoria. Now, why drainage structures? The need for bridges is evident when a railway has to cross a river, stream, valley or gorge. The example of um, Canyon de Ablo is obvious. You, you, when you look at how deep it is, you wouldn't want to be putting a fill in there. Um, it's, it's uneconomic to fill because earthworks cost big money. Um, and particularly in the olden days when they were moving dirt around with horses and drays and, and scoops and wheelbarrows and things where they used navvies, for example, in the UK with the early railroads. Um, <coughs> so um, there are two pieces and, and tunnels across a, you know, a very expensive um, pieces of civil engineering that railways just go out of the way to avoid. But we love them on model railroads. Within the landscape, such embankments act as dams, which away from bridges prevent the flow of water or intermittent water courses from one side to the other. Now, this is the point I'm trying to make when you look at model railroads, how many of them have these dams built over the whole, and you don't see, you know, they'll have a lovely bridge here, but when you look at it, you can't really see that all the land's flowing towards that river. Water runs downhill, doesn't run uphill, and you'll see areas where there are depressions which water would run through and basically wash the embankment away. And a lot of us, when you look at things, you don't realise, I mean, I went out to Broken Hill last year and they had the floods in the Lachlan system and out in the Menini Lakes. We nearly got stopped because the water was about well, kilometres wide each side of the main line and the water was virtually up to the top of the ballast. Now, you know, um, an old foreman once told me when I was building roads, he said he'd never seen a dry road fail. And that's pretty right. You know, water is, to earthworks is, is damaging. Dams, of course, are built specially to be impervious. They've got clay cores and things like that. Our embankments on roads and railways don't have that. So, you know, what you've got to do is stop that water infiltrating in uh, the stuff that doesn't infiltrate into the soil. It's going to flow across the land to the lowest point. Uh, now, I've got a water, water runs um, down cut batters and is collected in longitudinal table drains, which build up and must also be directed downstream of the adjoining fill embankments. Therefore, transverse culverts are essential to directing this water away from the embankment to avoid it building up and posing a threat to the earthworks. This is an area that I'm talking about today. 
um, which is often, as I say, neglected on model railroads, and I'm guilty of it myself. As I'll show you, this is an example uh, Doug and I were involved in building uh, Eternity Plains, which is our um, layout that we exhibit. Um, it's in N scale, double track, and you can see, oh, this, I think this might have a point, oh, it's got a point, a wonderful, if it shows up with the lights on. Maybe I need to try that. Can you see that? Oh, shit. On the wall, but... You mean I'm not, I'm not aiming too well? Oh, there it is. It's on the wall, but it wouldn't show Yeah, but it won't. Yeah, well, it's useless as tits on. Um, anyway, the blue and purple, you can see the water. I've had to sketch that on, so it's pretty rough and ready. Um, runs down the cut batters. And you'll see here, up in that area, in the background where the trees are, the water's also running downhill from that land. Now, it's then going to congregate at that point opposite the foreground tree on the other side of the railway embankment and we've got nothing so that straight red line shows where you should put a culvert to direct it into what's obviously the depression in the water course there now that's something we haven't done and hopefully when Doug and I get back we might rectify that if we've got the, t the time um, so that's just one example of the layout we've actually built, which we exhibit, which all of you will come along in the future, and if we haven't fixed it, you'll say, Boothie, you've stuffed up. <laughs> so types and design are culverts. The principal types of culverts and their materials are pipe culverts, and they can be made out of precast reinforced concrete, fibre cement reinforced concrete, corrugated steel, PVC, or Hobus plastic. Smaller diameters usually for the things like PVC and Hobus. Mainly in longitudinal drainage and a lot of home drainage and sewers and that, they use that Hobus now because it's very slippery. Um, <coughs> then you've got your reinforced concrete box culverts, either precast or cast in situ. You've got timber culverts, which you don't often see in Australia. And uh, you've got... Uh, <coughs> You've also got masonry arch culverts, either stone or in uh, brickwork. Uh, for election of what is appropriate for your layout, reference your prototype photos. That's your first place to go. Um, you know, one of the things, when you're out and about, use your eyes. You know, look at things and say, yeah, that's what they've done there. That's what I should transpose and do on my particular layout. Um, the other thing is reference prototype information. What were the standard types of culverts that your particular railroad used? Um, <coughs> you've got system standard drawings and specifications and photographs of particular sites are helpful. For the Santa Fe, I have system standards published by the Santa Fe Rail Historical and Biological Society. I picked them up second hand off a, a guy I knew in the hobby and I got them for $15 each. I mean, they're probably 50 US plus now, but you know, they've been, they've been invaluable to me and my friends in being able to, uh, to do stuff. And uh, just to show you a few, um, there's a couple of box culverts under Barstow Yard in California, a couple of big box culverts, to, because you can see there's high ground each, particularly on one side, uh, but, and on the other, and you've got raised embankments where the yard is, and uh, so they have to pick up that water and converse it through the site. One very important thing, which I haven't mentioned in there, but in the prototype, uh, railroads and railways do not like putting culverts underneath um, complex track work. Because if you get a wash away with the culvert, you've then got to spend a lot of money fixing that track up. So they tend to sort of locate their their uh, culverts, as you can see there, even though there might be six tracks there, or probably eight tracks, sorry. Um, you know, they, it's all straight. I think you've got one point, which is just to the one switch, just to the right of it, but they try and avoid that. So, um, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Doesn't want to work, I don't know. I think the battery's flat, really. Oh, that's it. Hang on, went one back, let's go. Sorry, we've gone two forward. I'm, now, that's, this is another culvert. This is um, constructed in 1998. You'll see in America, they often tend to, and they do do it sometimes in Australia as well, 
they stamp in the year of construction of the culvert. There's a reinforced concrete uh, pipe arch culvert. And you'll see in the background, it's, it's, you see where the green joins the, the blue and the tree line? That, is, that area out there in Nebraska is as flat as flat. Um, basically a lot of corn um, is grown there and um, lupins and things like that. Very flat, but you see even in flat country like that, they've got one pipe culvert there. Now this is the, this is the six standards. There's uh, three volumes, and this one's volume three. Uh, the chief way reference sy system um, standards, it's put out by Katrina Press, and that's volume three of three. Now what it's got in it, it's got this beautiful page, which has got designer culverts of various diameters, and it's got Mainly, as you see, they're all, they usually put in two pipes. They don't very rarely put in a single pipe culvert. The other one I've given by way of um, example is a masonry arch. So, I mean, the photographs. But hopefully, um, when you get this, I think they're giving everything digitally anyway to everybody, but when you get that, you can blow that up and have a look at it. But oh, it's just by way of example of what's available out there for everybody to, um, you know, model their own particular prototype. There's a, there's a, now I went from the smallest one to the largest one. You can see that's even got a two cell. Now they'll use those even for underpasses, the big ones. They're so big. Um, in, in Australia, we have, um, I mean, I've built them, uh, where we've had uh, roads or railways going through farming country and the, and the property owner's got uh, f farm or got land each side of the, the, um, the right of way will build what we call cattle creeps where he can take his cattle through and they could be large box culverts I've built them, I've also built um, reinforced concrete arch, uh, reinforced um, galvanised steel um, arch culverts and they put a concrete floor in them and you know they drive their tractors and take their cattle and everything through them very efficient anyway modeling pipe and box culverts now materials to model pipe culverts can be as easy as <coughs> get me a little bag Can't find it. get yourself a drinking straw nice and cheap product don't leave it red and white unless you're a Saints and a Swan supporter, but um, you know that actually equates. It's about three millimetres in diameter. Equates to about a 48-inch pipe, which is very, very, um, very, very. Um, sorry, an 18-inch pipe, I should say, 18-inch pipe, which is very common size of pipe. So you put three of them together and a head wall, and you've got a nice culvert. The other ones that used to be good were the um, were the uh, plastic ones you get with your ladies drinks but they're banned them now and they're just about impossible to get but I've got a good stock thanks very much but uh, yeah the, I, it, I had had to look around to try and find some and they said oh no we're not allowed to use those anymore so that was the end of that um, to cover the widest range of pipe diameters pipe culverts ABS plastic styrene stripes are most appropriate you can get round sections for pipe culverts you can get half round and channels, so you can make your, your arches. You use the um, half round for the top and your channel for the base. And of course, you use your channels for your RCBCs just on a um, bit of um, plastic sheet. Um, so you can get, as I say, channel or square sections for box culverts, either cast in situ or precast. Evergreen styrene carried by most hobby shops and architectural supplies. We can, all of us can get from someone. The other place I've found is AliExpress. Um, their prices for architectural shapes are probably about a third of evergreen styrene. And the stuff's good quality. Um, you know, it's, it's made for architects. So you can get, you know, length, they, they come in 25 le centimetre lengths, which is 10 inches. I mean, for us, that'll do you know, usually you only need about three inches to get under your right of way, so no matter, depending on how deep your fills are. So, you know, it goes a long way. And it's, 
you're talking about um, you know, 10 lengths or something for around about the $3 mark. So it's very cost effective. I'm not trying to take business away from the local hobby shops, but we've all got to watch a dollar. And um, Evergreen just keeps going up and up. Corrugated steel pipe can be modelled by wrapping aluminium cooking foil, our foils one brand, around a thin threaded bolt of appropriate diameter. And the finer the thread, the better for that. But that's a, that's a cheap cheap way to do it. You can, you can, if you want to be real prototypical, if you're going to have a bit hanging out, you can always slice it into a thin strip and so that you've actually got it wound like it is in real life. If you're not so worried about that in N-scale, you just have it have the corrugations running straight across the screw. Or you, you know, it's quite easy to do them on the angle anyway. So uh, that's a few ideas. Come on. I'll tell you what, I reckon if, if this hasn't got bad batteries on my bad yards, judge. You've got a smack in the ear. Oh, I need something. Oh, that work? Two. You went two, you go back one. Go back one? Yeah. Too big in the finger? Yeah. yeah. All right. There's your, there's, I've done a table for you where I've looked at prototype, prototype, prototype standard diameters and, um, and then I've, in millimetres I've converted them to inches, rough, roughly, and then there's the styrene dimensions that you can buy that I've seen, you know, usually they're, they're, you get two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven's rare, and then you can get twelve. Eleven I've seen far, but you don't, you know, just pick you. I mean, you've got... Plenty of pipe sizes there to choose from. I don't think you'll uh, have too much worry. No, I'm going to go. It worked, didn't it? Shit. Um, head walls, wing walls, and aprons. Head walls, wing walls, and aprons and culvers serve two main purposes. One's to support the batter material around the pipe and stop it falling into the inlet outlet. Protect the inlet outlet from scour by providing a concrete apron base. And that's often associated with a uh, cutoff wall where they actually um, extend it down into the ground, uh, could be uh, a foot to 18 inches, 300 to 450, and that's just to stop the eddies at the end of the pipe, basically undermining that, um, that apron and leaving it proud and then subject to sort of breaking off. Um, a number of different types of commercially made head walls are available in N scale. And these examples are known to me. Other people may know more. You want to add to that, but you've got Woodland Scenics. I've given the cat numbers. Um, you get concrete culvert head wall two per pack, masonry arch culvert head wall two per pack, random stone arch culvert two per pack, and timber box culverts two per pack. And then Blair Line, line makes some very good concrete box culverts. Um, you know, this is if you, you don't want to go the you, know, you just want something that looks right and will probably match a prototype somewhere. Um, they've got their concrete box culverts. Now, the next, the 1807 is supposed to be N scale, the 1808 is supposed to be HO or vice versa. But the HO one's just a big, bigger box culvert in N scale, that's all it is. So you can, no worries about using HO stuff in N because it's probably appropriate. Okay, just a few photos. That packet I got down off the internet, it's not real clear, but that's Woodland Scenes, the paddock packets they come in, and that's an example of it in use. There's more Woodland Scenics. You've got the masonry, the stone, and you've got the timber, just to, to just show you what they look like. But, um, you know, nothing there might match something in your New South Wales or Victorian or South Australian prototype. So that's where you have to go, or if you're modelling in the States, SP, UP, New York Central, whatever, you have to go back to the standard drawings. And, and if you want to get pedantic, well, you, you make something that's totally, totally right. Um, here's your um, Blair line, the box culverts, what they look like. You can see the small ones, the so-called N-scale one, and the one, the bigger ones are supposedly HO, but 
you know, you just get that and put that on your later. It's just a big box culvert. Um, so as I say, they're, they're red, they should be available. Um, additional examples of commercial made head walls listed in N scale that are known to me, but I can't guarantee availability because as you know, with a lot of these companies, they get bought out. Like um, when I've been traveling, we've first thing we do when we get to a hobby shop is we go through all their detail parts because you know, they're hard to come by. And um, I've collected quite a bit of Cal, Cal Freight and detail stuff, but they've been taken over by another company. Um, I didn't list that, but I, but if you go online and look up Cal Freight, they'll tell you. And they, what they did, they bought all their stock, everything they made, and they've, you'll go down and some things will be sold out. You won't be able to get it. But anyway, have a look. Another... Another source for head walls now, as for other end scale detail parts, is the 3D printing industry, um, you know, Shapeways. And I've just put the IP address up for Shapeways um, so you can get a bit of a head start. Um, and of course, you may have someone in your club or that you know that has a 3D printer, and there's a lot of what they call freeware, shareware now that you can just download. Uh, you know, and um, and pr and get someone to print them for you. I've never really seen the need for my own purposes to go out, and um, and I'm not as you know. I'm usually don't haven't shown it today much, but I'm usually computer competent. Um, but I'm I really haven't wanted to get into 3D printing. I leave that to others. We have a fellow in our club who's excellent at it, so. You know, you just ask around, someone will be able to help you and do things for you as a price, or you just go on the web and just order them in. As we all know, things from Europe or the US are now getting prohibitive as far as postage goes. There's your California freight and detail products, what they make, just to give you an idea, they're, they're cast resin, and there's a three pipe culvert each side and there's a single pipe culvert on the end. But that's the little packets they come in. Oh, I've got it there. They were acquired by Duben LLC and they claim to have hundreds of boxes so check with their site to see what's still available. And there tends to be a fair bit on eBay but once again the, the postage kills you. Now scratch building culvert head walls, wing walls and aprons. Um, as I say, not, not hard, it's just a matter of taking the time. And that's sort of what I've come up with as a recipe. Um, scratch building culvert head walls, wing walls and aprils, not difficult. Steps as follow. Obtain a copy of a standard or actual specific culvert drawing from the appropriate prototype railway um, or photographs. And then you can scale down off the photograph what you think it roughly is. The other source I would say is that with the Santa Fe, and I know a lot of other railroads and railways, they have trackage diagrams for a whole length, like the New South Wales Railways might have, I don't know, just take for example, might have Newcastle and Maitland. You can get a track diagram that'll tell you where every bridge and every culvert is on that length. That's for use of, for their asset management and for their maintenance away people. So they know what they got there and when they go out to a site, they say, right, I know that's a, um, that's a uh, two foot diameter, three cell pipe culvert. They know exactly what they'll find. So you can go onto their sites and you can, should be able to get a copy of those. And if you're modelling a particular length of rail, you don't have to, railway, you don't have to go out there and photograph every bit of it, although it would help um, because some of them are pretty inaccessible sometimes. But, um, you know, you can, you can download those off the web. I know for the Santa Fe I can do it and I've actually got um, printed copies of, of the area that, areas that I'm interested in. Um, so once you get that, you just transfer that across to, um, I say, um, yeah, any generic railway, you'll find that the designs are consistent. Um, there's only so many ways, civil engineering-wise, to build a pipe culvert and, and the standards 
are generally very close to each other. So if you had access to say a Vic Road culvert standard and you use that on the railway, the only thing that might, difference, might, might be different is the height of the fill, for example, and the thickness of the head wall walls and things like that. So you can just adjust, but whatever you put there will, will look right anyway. No one's going to know, unless they're an expert on the same length of <laughs> railway that, that you're modelling. Um, so look, 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 look right. You know, as I said, culvert capacity is consistent with the topography and the catchment. Don't put a piddly um, 300 mil 12 inch pipe in an area that's draining, you know, about five hectares, you know, because it's just going to be overwhelmed. <coughs> um, you take a standard of drawing, scale it down, and uh, then you then it's a matter of once you've got the dimensions, you. Um, convert them to the styrene using a scale rule or alternatively tediously convert the actual measurements by dividing by 160 or um, 148 if you're into British and uh, yeah, off you go. One, once you've transcribed that you then can cut it out, um, you transcribe it to the sheet, use a fine lead propelling pencil I use, mark a pen or scriber the sheet styrene most commonly in N-scale will be one millimetre thick for small culvert head walls, which typically have six inch, 150 millimetre thick walls, um, and bigger ones maybe 12 inches. Now also then you can face them if you like with the appropriate masonry stone or brick. You can use, for example, if you're building a, um, a stone or, or brick head wall, you can access um, slaters from the UK, you know, the plastic sheets and cut them out of that. You've already got it there. Or you can do them in styrene and use brick or, um, you know, stone paper to, to go over the top. Um, yeah, the head wall, wing wall and apron should be marked out as a complete piece. You know, you know and, and as if you're going to fold it and uh, just go round it and then the holes and openings for pipe culverts can be drilled, which I think is probably better and easier to do than, or you can remove it with a punch. With a punch, you've got to be pretty careful that it doesn't um, crack in, elsewhere into the, uh, into the uh, styrene. Uh, openings for box or arch culverts can cut out with a sharp hobby knife, don't slip. Prior to cutting the complete head wall, wing wall, apron piece from the sheet of styrene with a sharp hobby knife, score along the lines between the head wall and wing wall and head wall and apron so that the wing walls and apron can be bent into place and then glued into position. The whole assembly can then be glued to the make a total col pipe culvert. If you want to strengthen it up, put a length of um, styrene as a base and put your pipes on top of that because behind the head wall it won't be seen because it's all going to ha have fill around it anyway. So um, that's all I've got for you. Here's a few model examples. This is a reinforced concrete arch culvert. Um, oh, by the way, before I get into some photos, anybody got any questions along the way they'd like to ask? Please fire away. Um, the masonry ones made of pre-date concrete, they all would have been replaced. That's right, yeah. yeah. When, when were they started using well, um, a guy called Monia, who happened to be, we all know Monia Pipes, a man called Monia, he actually was the first person in the world to construct pre-spun concrete pipes, where they put the re a reinforcing cage inside a big cylinder. They then pump the concrete in and they rotate and they use centrifugal force to form the walls of the pipe. And they do the same thing with box culverts. And he was the one who actually invented that process. The first Monia box culvert anywhere in the world is actually on the Moonby Range on the New England Highway. Um, but um, that would have been after the Second World War. Okay? So anything pre the Second World War um, still Still, remember in the 30s when we had the Depression, a lot of our roads in, well, particularly Sydney and I'm pretty sure Melbourne too, a lot of the drainage in Sydney and Newcastle was all built by people that were on the dole um, during the Depression. And that's all, that's all still standing today and it's all reinforced concrete. 
and you try and, I can tell you from experience, you try and break it up, it's as hard as the knobs. So, you know, they did a good job. 60 um, MPA. Sorry? 60 MPA. Yeah, probably, and maybe a bit more. I mean, cur currently for, um, the, when you see these pavers working on um, freeway construction, they're doing concrete paving, that concrete's 40 MPA. <coughs> Um, it used to be 30, I think they've now upped it to 40 because, and, and uh, it's, um, it's 100, 170 mil thick in the base and 150 <coughs> mil thick in the sub base. The sub base is only 5 MPA. But yeah, so I mean, when they're mixing it themselves, remember they're doing it in drum mixes, like, like our standard domestic uh, concrete mixes, but these ones. I mean, I had them when I first, many years ago, started working for the DMR, and they're massive things. And then we'd have them on site because they just weren't the precast, pre, uh, the um, the concrete mix plants around like there are today. But um, a lot of that concrete, you know, w the designs were a bit iffy, and they tended, to, you know, put more cement in them and less water, and the stronger it is, you know. So yeah. So there's two there. There's one on each. Um, of those lines, you've got the two lines on the Santa Fe over Cajon Pass, and uh, there's a. I've actually fit, stayed with uh, Ted at his house, and a lovely man, elder of the Mormon Church, he is. There's one on uh, David Howis layout showing, uh, and in that's actually O scale, but it's to show you what you can do. That and and yeah, you know, that's something you might not think about. The longitudinal drain comes down, it goes into a, a pit or a sump, and then the pipe then takes the water to the other side of the railway line. Doug Cook has one very similar on his layout. If you go on to um, the NMRA site, there's an extensive library of um, photographs of Doug's layout. You can see he's, he's, he's someone who's done an awful lot of culverts, so yeah. Um, That's one I took out of um, April Model Railroader. Again, a double box culvert with the date that it was constructed, which is um, 1931. And uh, a couple of Santa Fe a PAPB set going across the top of it. Uh, I think that's about it. So I didn't want to overall, you know, go into thousands of photos, so. Um, we, we've, if, if anybody's got any questions or needs any, yeah, you know. Just here, here, sure. Here, just a source, other than expensive evergreening stuff, I've made use of kilometrico pins, the barrels. Kilometric? Yeah, kilometrico biros. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh exactly. Oh, spot on. If you've got kids or use um, the thinner barrel, you know, multi set coloured textures. Um, you know, for edging card kits or you've got kids or grandkids, just put, as they expire, just grab a few of them. They're, there's lots of plastic tubes around. Plastic tubes, just look for them. I mean, I, I suppose being an ex-alcoholic, I chose the, the, the straws. No, not really. But, I mean, they were freely available. And when you used to be able to get the, the black plastic ones in pubs and clubs, they were really good for, for smaller pipes. You can still get them. You'd have to. Oh, okay. Hang on, I'll just write that down. What's he doing? Yeah, they, you know, like they have them in. They get short ones there like that. Yes. They used to the ones that they gave me. They were about like this long. Yeah, we just get four culverts out of those, or four pipes, you know. Yeah, so your model railway club or all your friends are well supplied in pipe material, are they? Go that way, yeah. yeah, well, they will want to go there after this presentation, <laughs> won't they? <laughs> they don't want their earthworks to be washed away. Yeah, well, the, the ones you, you once you actually um, get from AliExpress, they're 10, they're 10, 10 inches long, they're 250 mil, so you get quite a few. But look, just look anywhere with your day to day. Look, we all do that as modelers. There's been books written on it, you know, commonly used items that can be diverted to model railroading. I mean, you know, and there's another example, you know, the, the disused um, centres, because let's face it, it's got a bit of ink in it, it doesn't matter, because when you, 
How far up a pipe do you see on a layout, you know? Actually, the barrel, but not the, the ink bit, but the actual... Oh, you're barrel. using the barrel. Yeah, of yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, that'd be good for bigger pipes, yeah, well, for sure. We've got construction photos on the... Um, you got them on U on, on USB? Like we'll the, put them on. Size, but yeah, I've got a, the laptop. Too. You should have brought it with you. I could have put them on and yeah, showed everybody. Yeah. Think Very you slack. Size modules on the laptop display. Okay. The we're on. No, thank you. Yeah. But, you know, as I say, it's a matter of, hey, using these, look around. And, yeah, and okay. you're about to put something in the bin, you know. Oh, gee, I want a really big tunnel or a culvert. I'll use that Coke can and I'll, I'll bend it to shape, yeah. you know. Well, for people who are a modelling Victorian, always remember there's Mark Bowers infrastructure website. And you can get down the bottom of that. There's all F drawings. That's a drawing of every single thing that Victorian Railways ever made, including standard desks and paper trays and everything. Yeah. So it's all there. They got everything in there. Yeah. Look, Colbert design and everything else. And as John pointed out, for um, if you're looking at track designs and track layout plans, electrical diagrams, always have Colberts in them. To show yeah. you where they are. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and as was, was said by Ray, that, that's what I pointed in, uh, uh, tried to point out to people, just to direct you where these sources of knowledge are. Because to be quite honest, even people that have been in the, the hobby for a long time don't know about these. And, um, you know, any of us that have worked for a state authority, they, they've got to call tenders for the supply of something concrete pipes so there's a spec on con design of concrete pipes what they're, they're and testing of them what loads they've got to be and all that sort of because just remember with a box culvert or with a pipe they've got to get it from the casting yard onto a truck truck's got to come out to the web, web the site and then you've got to handle it on the job site to put it in place so they the, the stresses that they're under aren't necessarily the stresses when they're in the ground it's the handling and stresses. Yes, Doug. In addition to what this gentleman was, the gentleman was saying about Victoria in New South Wales, I don't know whether it's still the same now, everything's been privatised, but there's, there was a standard for everything yep. that was used on the railway. Mm. And there was mountains and mountains of stuff. And I think there's a lot of it, a, a facility out near Penrith somewhere but you can act, go in and you can access all of these standards. But there's one addition to the, I don't know whether it applied to Victoria. You could do variations to the standard as long as you got the okay from the local division engineer. Yes. Mm. You know, if you saw something that wasn't a standard, oh, that's not the standards, but you can... Oh, the division engineer said it was okay, so you get out of it. What it basically, as Doug said, what it, what it basically was, it was designed for idiots. So in other words, everyone was, everything was designed by engineers or road design draftsmen in an office. They had a standard plan and that went out. And if I knew I was building a 16 cell box culvert in the boonies west of West Wyalong on the Midwestern Highway, that w I'd go out and build that, but it'd have a set of standard drawings that were drawn up for that particular structure. If I was putting in a two-cell box culvert somewhere, there wouldn't be a set of drawings for that. It'd just be a standard drawing. They just pulled off their library and went out and it told you how much, where, how much steel, how it was bent, where it went into the head walls, the wing walls, the aprons, etc. And you just went out and you built that to that recipe. Told you what concrete to use. Usually it was 20 mil... 20 megapascal, um, sometimes 25, but that that was you just built that and that was to the standard. But if it was a specific job, like a 16 cell box culvert, it's a big box culvert, it has a specific set of drawings and specifications. And as I said before, Doug pointed out about every state road authority and every rail authority has these, and they should be. I know for all the road authorities because I did check. And there, I thought, oh, well, maybe I only got access to the the Department of Transport ones in New South Wales because of the fact that I used to work there or something, and I've, I've got books of them, of course. Um, now the stuff's in, available online, and I checked, and, and all that stuff still is there. Because, you know, basically, I mean, I had people work for me, and I'm sure any of us that have worked in construction had the same. Mm -hmm. I had people work for me who were totally illiterate, couldn't read or write. 
And basically, you have to tell them, right, what you want there is a 20 mil bar, and you and and you know it's got to go like, it, it, and the bars would be bent by a steel fabricator. You'd they'd come to the site like that, and the guys just had to be able to read the picture to know where to put them all. And you know, nothing tends to fall down. But if you build embankments across ground and you don't provide from water flowing from one side to the other. I can guarantee you that that embankment sooner or later will get washed away. And that's not a good thing because when trains aren't running, they're not making any money. We went where, where we went when we went yesterday. Remember, they said about the flood and they had trains blocked up on the Nullarbor Plain because they couldn't go from one point to the other. Now, the thing is, when you get rain like they had out in the Nullarbor, from an engineering perspective, they're not going to design for that because the, they'd add, you'd end up with one big continuous cul, set of culverts right across areas and it becomes too expensive. So they take into account that most drainage is designed for about a one in 20 year event, right? Now, major structures like bridges are one in 100 year or 1% events. So culverts being cheaper sort of structures, they're not designed to the same amount and maybe there will be um, failures. Um, when you go up, say, in New Mexico, Arizona, which is very flat, but it, you've got these big, broad valleys, and you look in the background, you've got ridges and, and mountains, um, you can be out there, and, and in summer, it's, you know, 100 degrees plus, and then all of a sudden, a thunderstorm will come in, and these bridges that, um, you know, the Santa Fe's put in all those years ago, that every time you've gone over them for the last 20 years, you've never seen any water in them, they'll be running, a, you know, they'll run it, be running full of water. So when you get, I mean, I, I work around West Wyalong in New South Wales, which is pretty flat. There are three trees, uh, creeks up there, Two Tree Creek, Black Creek and Back Creek. And they have falls in them. When we, we talk about water flowing downhill, the falls in those creeks is one inch in a mile. That's how flat they are. And yet, you know, I've been 75 and 74, 75 and 76. We had big floods there. And like, you know, you couldn't get into West Wyalong from the north because all the causeways were all flooded. They subsequently gone through and put all big pipe culverts in there. But they're massive big viaducts. There are a lot of pipe culverts that take that water when it comes up. And they, they may only be, like I said, I saw three floods in three years. You might have another 30 years and you don't have any floods out there at all. So they work on basically one in 20. But, um, you know, when, when, when infrastructure floods uh, and people can't go from A to B, it, it's big money cost. You know, when a, when a freeway gets blocked because of an accident, I mean, I had arguments with the, the police because uh, they're saying, oh, we can't clear you the highway. Oh, I, got, I got the freeway from Sydney, uh, Sydney to Newcastle. And I remember one day we had a truckload of oranges and they said, oh, we've got to wait the insurance people get here. And I said, no, I've got to get the, tr I, get, I overruled the police sergeant and I said, no, I got, a, I got a loader and just pushed the truck over the side of the road to open up for traffic. I said, these oranges, I said, come on, these oranges are going to be spoiled. You know, I said, you're not going to save anything. So, you know, you had to get the road open because I know one we had, we had Neville Rand stuck in 11 kilometre queue. <laughs> Did we get some paperwork over that, you know? It wasn't our fault. It was someone having a car accident yeah, on their free. Sorry? You should have kept him here. You could have got the laws changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, put it this way. I, we've had a few bad ones since him, let me tell you, and particularly transport man managers, you know. But one of the problems, you know, without getting on my high horse is the public services in Queensland and uh, New South Wales and Victoria, particularly in the roads area, being denuded of expertise, you know. I mean, I was mentoring people before I left and I don't know who's going to mentor the people that come after them because, you know, there's no bastard left who knows anything, yeah. you know. They're getting to the point, we talk about calling contracts and that, all these standard drawings, they, they haven't got enough expertise to be an informed client. And, and I had discussions with uh, contractors and consultants years ago and I said, look, when they're all gone, you try putting in a bid for something when you're not dealing with an informed client, um, it's just going to get down to one thing and that's price where we'd analyse something and something might be a bit expensive, it gave you more value for money. You went, you could sign off and take that 
that bid. And oh, they're all any that I'm friends with me now that I see through the Institution of Engineers and that, they're all saying it's diabolical working with any of the road authorities now. But that's that's just the world we live in. So um, people people don't like experts because you know, the reason I left was because they didn't like people saying yes and no in the wrong places, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, they, well, sometimes they're no men and they say the no in the right place too, you know, so that's just the way it is. Um, anything else, gentlemen? Any other questions? Okay, so on behalf of the committee and everything that organised this, thanks very much, John. Um, I came to this clinic for, I guess the reason a lot of you did, is to, because this is a totally neglected area of, there's engineering that goes on underneath your railway and it's to do with moving oh, water. I'm doing an overemphasis on Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I did have a UP culvert in there, Doug. So, th thanks very much, John, and... Um, Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Ron. Thank all right, move on to morning tea. Anyway, I hope it was worthwhile and um <laughs>